David, are you ready? We're live. Everybody can hear us. All right. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your patience in working out a few of these technical difficulties. I pray that everyone is safe and healthy. We have authority to hold a virtual meeting pursuant to the executive order number 20-69 issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20th, 2020, and executive order number 20-112, which extends that order. The Space Coast TPO may conduct meetings of its governing board and its committees without having a quorum of its members present physically or at any specific location and utilizing communications, media technology, such as telephonic or video conferencing, as provided by section 120.54 5B2, Florida statute. Procedures for the public comment will be explained shortly. shortly. The members of the governing board will be appearing at today's meetings remotely. At this point, Madam Chair, would you please call the meeting to order? Thank you, Georgiana. In the meeting, I'm gonna call to order Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization, the governing board meeting this Thursday, May 14, 2020. And next, please uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And at this time, I'd like to ask Laura to review some housekeeping items and please ensure a quorum exists. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Laura Carter with Space Coast TPO. Um, on the slide right now that you are seeing are some of the housekeeping items that we would like to go over on how the meeting will be conducted today, how you will have opportunities to speak and vote on agenda items with actions. You should be able to see how to join an audio. You have your mic and speakers. Um, use a telephone and dial in using the information provided that was given to you on an email. Please keep yourself muted to minimize background noise at all times. If you are having any issues, you may submit them using the questions or the chat box via the GoToWebinar panel. If you would like to speak, you may use the raise your hand item. We will use that in a moment to practice. The hand raising function is what we'll be using today to make motions for voting. I would also like to call your attention, you should also have a handout section, the agenda, agenda package, there is a summary of actions for item 5B for the TAC, CAC also available for download, along with the committee add-on. We have one additional committee appointment. And under presentations, item 8A, there are some handouts for the Florida Transportation Plan. So for the voting process, we want to take a practice run at this now. At the same time, this will be a mechanism for us to be conducting a quorum and attendance call. So when we request a motion, um, Chair will ask for a motion in a second. We will be looking for the raised hand. The first two that we see raised, we will acknowledge as being the one making the motion first and the second hand we see being the second. We will then remove all the raised hands and if there's no discussion for the vote, we will ask you to raise your hand using the panel there with the little hand symbol. I will call off your name, validating that we are recording your vote. At the end, I will ask if anybody has been missed so that if you don't raise your hand and have stepped away, your vote will not be accidentally calculated. So at this point in time, I would ask for the TPO board members only to please use the raised hand symbol on your go-to attribute. Mr. Nolan, are you having any issues raising your hand because you are the first one on the list? Check on mute him? Yeah. He's been on mute. Mr. Nolan, I still have him muted. Yes. Okay. Do you are you able to use the raise hand motion or are we going to do you want us to verbally unmute you each time we have an action item? Raised hand. 
Yeah, Ready. there's a little hand Ready. symbol. Ready. Ready. The only problem I don't see is any other. It would. Can you see the voting process practice slide? Yes. So I'm you'll have your mute team. button. At the bottom of that should be a hand symbol. Yeah, I pressed it. Is it working on your system? No, it's okay. not. Okay. Well, we will note that we will need to ask you verbally. Next, I should have Lorraine Cost. Thank you. Brian Lower from District 2, thank you. Frank Forrester from Rockledge, thank you. Mr. Anderson from Palm Bay. I have unmuted him. Can you please un self mute? There you go, thank you. <laughs> um, Andrea Young? She's gone. Uh, okay. Jerry Allender? He is via phone, it looks like. Um, hold on, let me send him a pen. Oh, his audio pen. I, I can verbally tell him that, but I can't send it. Andrea okay. Young sent an email and said that she's here. She doesn't have an icon. Okay. Christina Snardi, thank you. Yvonne Midas, thank you. Skip Williams. Yep. I already got him. He's been moved down. And Robert Jordan. Have I missed anybody? I'm going to clear the hands. Please raise your hand if I missed you. We need to. Andrew Young, we got you. Thank you. And I got Skip. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lorraine Koss, um, please be noticed that Jake Williams is not able to call in, so you will be the voting member for the city of Coco. That does establish a quorum chair. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, and then, thank you very much, Laura. And now, uh, Georgiana. Now I'd like to provide some procedures on how the public can participate. Any person may be heard by the governing board through the chair, and upon registering pursuant to the notice published on the TPO's website, and on any proposition before the TPO's governing board unless modified by the chair. Since this is a virtual meeting as authorized by the governor of the state of Florida, members of the public wishing to address the body may do so by visiting www.spacecoasttpo.com to attend the virtual meeting. With regard to access to the meeting, the agency is using GoToWebinar. This is a cloud-based platform for video and audio conferencing, collaboration, and chat across mobile devices, desktops, and telephones. In order to ensure that the public has the ability to view the meeting, the Space Coast TPO will be broadcasting the meeting live on Space Coast Government TV and posting a recording of the meeting via its YouTube channel. With regard to public comment, the Space Coast TPO has developed several methods of ensuring public comment for this virtual meeting. Those wishing to provide comments during the meeting may register and attend virtually. Participants must register if wishing to attend virtually. You may raise your hand or enter your request to speak via the GoToWebinar chat question box, either during public comment or at the time the agenda item is discussed. Once recognized by the chair, your microphone will be unmuted and you will be given three minutes for comment. Communications media technology shall be made available to participate and provide public comment at the following location, Vieira Government Center, Building B, 2725 Judge Fran Jameson Way, Melbourne, Florida. When addressing the TPO Governing Board, a member of the public must first state his or her name, his or her address, and what item will be spoken about. The public was also given an opportunity to provide advanced written and verbal comments via email, the United States Postal Service, or through the main phone line 321-690-6890. Comments received by 4 p.m. the day prior to this meeting will be read aloud for the record. Verbal and written comments will also be accepted after the meeting by emailing lisa.hickman at brevardfl.gov or calling our office at 321-690-6890. 
Written comments will be accepted no later than three business days after the virtual meeting. All written comments will be included as part of the official public record of the meeting. You will need to give your name, address, agenda item you are speaking to, and comments. For all of the aforementioned options, all the comments received will be included in the public record of the meeting. For these options, the Space Coast TPO has created a simple set of instructions explaining how the public may submit their comments with either option. The instructions were provided in the notice to the public and published online at www.spacecoasttpo.com on our website. Anyone wishing to appeal any decision by the Governing Board for any matter considered at this meeting may need to prepare a verbatim record of the item being appealed to a court. We ask everyone to please silence all cell phones and other noise-making devices. The TPO rules of procedure, decorum, and policy governing the public comment period shall be followed and enforced in the same manner as if the meeting were held in person. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to our chair, uh, Ms. Mina. Thank you, uh, Georgiana. Uh, next item is the item number three, approval of the ratification of the Executive Director's Emergency Order 20-15, and then Georgiana. The TPA's emergency order was issued on April the 23rd, uh, 2020. Uh, board members, following direction from a legal counsel, we would like you to ratify uh, no pro tunk these procedures as well as the uniform rules adopted pursuant to emergency order 20-15. We are asking for approval of the executive director's emergency order 20-15. Uh, for those of you uh, that don't know what nook pro tunk means, it is Latin legalese. It means that your ratification relates back to the date of the issuance of the TPO's emergency order, which was April 23rd. because he does not have his pen entered. <clears throat> Mr. Lober, you need to enter pound one, two, seven, pound in order to activate your audio. I can't unmute you without your pen being entered. We can move to Robert Jordan. Right. audio is also turned off. Okay, at this time now, Lower is only self-muted. Commissioner Lober, if you could please unmute yourself. I, we, we saw that your hand was raised. We're assuming you would like to speak. Um, you need to unmute yourself. Raise your 
Brian Koss, Brian Lober, Frank Forrester, Brian Anderson, Christina Znardi, Yvonne Minus, Skip Williams, Robert Jordan, Andrea Young, Mayor Meehan. Uh, Mr. Allender, we do not have a vote from Mr. Allender or Jim Nolan. I can unmute Jim, Mr. Nolan. Mr. Nolan, I have unmuted you if you'd like to unmute yourself to cast your vote. One pre uh, written public comment that I would like to read. For okay, the very good. From Mr. Edward Hines, 2345 Botanica Circle, West Melbourne. For the Vision Zero project, two hazard reports have been submitted related to a proposed road construction project in West Melbourne. The project would extend Heritage Oaks Boulevard to the east and extend Dotery Drive to the south till they meet. One of the hazard reports pertains to the new intersection planned for Henry Avenue. And Doherty. Doherty. Henry already experiences heavy congestion that often blocks access to up to five side streets. The city has acknowledged this problem and has put an ineffective band aid on it by posting several signs on the side of the street and on the road surface. But the new road extensions would make this problem even worse. According to the city's traffic study, the extensions will induce heavy cut through traffic via Henry because drivers will want to avoid the more congested US 192 and Minton Road intersection. Cut through tour traffic is notorious for speeding, reckless driving, and accidents. The city is not bothering to put in a traffic light. Since the intersection is a school crossing, this is particularly vexing. So an area that is hazardous is going to become more hazardous. The second hazard report pertains to the impact of the new road extension on the intersection of Heritage Oaks and Minton. This intersection is already a hazardous school crossing. A county study quotes school crossing guards there are saying, quote, there are almost, they are almost hit by vehicles daily, end quote. Again, cut through traffic, which is notorious for speeding, reckless driving, and accidents, will make this school crossing intersection even more hazardous. At this time, there is profound uncertainty about our economy, and therefore about the funding that will be available for transportation needs at the city, county, and state levels. This is not the time to be squandering funds on a project which is unnecessary, far less useful than the original design, and which in some ways would make our neighborhoods less safe. The funding should be held in reserve for essential high priority projects that enhance transportation safety. The county has also some direct responsibility here because it is funding the project via transportation impact fees. The project needs to be canceled now. More info, including frequently asked questions, maps, studies, analysis, photos, videos, historical background, how the concept was watered down from the more useful original design, detailed summaries of citizen comments at city council meetings and links to relevant sources are available here. www.saynotodoetree.com. All right, thank you, Laura. Uh, next is re uh, item five is reports, and uh, 5A is the executive director's report, Georgiana. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to brief everyone on uh, just a few items. Um, First, the Central Florida Expressway Authority has kicked off the Osceola Brevard County Connector Study. Um, the purpose of the study is to evaluate the feasibility of a future expressway connection from Osceola County to I-95 and Brevard County. Um, improving evacuation routes and promoting regional connectivity uh, is certainly a need. Uh, the study will look at options from an engineering and environment standpoint. And the study area uh, is currently being extended up to the 520 area as well. Um, so there is, they are looking at a larger area than what is identified on this flyer. But it's a 
15-month study, and you will be hearing a lot more about this as the study progresses. Um, uh, this is very high-level planning, so we're looking at beyond the 2045 uh, time frame. So this would be beyond our long-range transportation plan, but we do need to start looking at where that connection would be in Brevard County for future planning. Next, uh, FDOT's Transplex Planning Innovation of the Year was awarded to our TPO's 2019 Bike Ped Master Plan, Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan. So congratulations to Sarah Crom, our Multimodal Program Specialist, as, along with our uh, consulting team, Kittleson and Associates. Uh, Travis Hills is with us here today. Um, and of course, it was up against some steep competition. Uh, it was it tied with Broward uh, MPO's Complete Streets Master Plan. So congratulations to Sarah. The Space Coast Chapter of the Florida Public Relations Association awarded Abby Hemingway, the TPO's Public Involvement Officer, the Award of Distinction and the Judges Award for our 2019 Public Participation Plan. Uh, so Sarah and Abby are doing an excellent job uh, on behalf of the TPO, and, and we're very proud of their accomplishments, so we wanted to bring that to your attention. Wanted to give you a quick update on the State Road 528 Indian River Lagoon circulation analysis. If you remember, the St. John's River Water Management asked for uh, six months uh, extension to conduct their analysis to, to, to determine if causeway removal and elevating bridge spans along 528 would improve the circulation and the health of the, the Indian River Lagoon. That study uh, has now been finalized. Uh, there is a Microsoft Teams meeting for next Monday uh, with all the stakeholders to discuss the results of that study. Um, and the stakeholders would be the DOT, Indian River Lagoon Council, Brevard County, and the Port Authority. Um, there will be a presentation at our next scheduled meeting, uh, which uh, will be held in July. Um, and I have let the St. John's River Water Management know that I would like to share any information from that study and analysis with the governing board members as soon as possible. And so they are aware of that and we will try to get you that information as soon as we, we possibly can. So I wanted to let you know that that is coming up in July and July is a, a really important meeting between this subject and uh, the adoption of our project priorities and the transportation improvement program. So stay tuned about that. One of the items that we've been eyeing very closely is a transportation stimulus package. Um, collectively, the 27 MPOs of Florida are members of the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, called AMPO, and the National Association of Regional Councils, uh, uh, affectionately known as NARC. Both organizations have submitted letters to congressional leadership requesting funds for infrastructure in the next coronavirus relief package. And they are asking um, the TPOs to do the same. Um, the approach being taken by Congress uh, at this time is to replace transportation funds lost because of the economic slowdown caused by the pandemic. Um, specifically, if we have projects in our region that are in danger of being delayed or canceled due to the lack of funding, uh, they have asked that we consider writing a letter to our congressional showing real examples of how the economy is being harmed. So from a DOT standpoint, you know, we don't know if any of, of, uh, if any of the projects will be affected, but I have a good idea of where the danger uh, might come concerning our projects. So, you know, at the end of the day, Florida is a really good investment for stimulus dollars and we can help with the economic recovery and as we all know, for every dollar spent on infrastructure, there's a return on investment of $4.40 in Florida. That may not be the case in other states, but it certainly is in Florida. So with the TPO board's permission, I would like to submit a letter on behalf of the Space Coast TPO to our congressional delegation. And as the, the, uh, the new stimulus bill may be uh, coming, we, we, there's, I'm sure there will be lots of negotiation to take place but we definitely want to, to be on top of this and I can get as much money from Brevard County as we can. Um, and so um, 
finally, I'd like to ask Space Coast Area Transit Director Scott Nelson to, to, give, a, to, to give a quick update. But before I do, are there any members, uh, any members, TPO members that have questions for me? Any questions for Georgina? No, however, um, Mr. Lober has made a motion to authorize uh, Ms. Gillette to make it so. Thank you. I don't know if we need a motion and a second on that, do we? I, I don't think we need a motion, but, but unless there's an objection, I appreciate that. I will certainly move forward in sending a letter to our delegation, okay. congressional delegation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Georgina. Next will be 5B, the Technical Advisory Committee, oh, oh. Citizens Advisory oh, Committee. Hold on. I'm sorry. We, I'm sorry. We wanted to hear from Scott. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I've unmuted him on our end. He just needs to unmute himself. So, Scott, uh, we wanted to get an update from you, um, and you are unmuted on our end. Uh, you may have to unmute your side, your button. Got it. Okay. Uh, great. It's, it's great to talk with you, and uh, uh, I wanted to give you a little status report on Space Coast Area Transit. Um, we back months ago we we had started an extra cleaning regimen uh especially in our buildings and the terminals because of a uh, hepatitis local advisory and we continued that uh once the uh covid pandemic began the adult day training centers regard achievement center bridges etc uh, closed as you all know uh, in late march uh, eastern florida state college closed a lot of our riders, uh, you know, in the hotel industry and, and others, uh, uh, restaurants, uh, weren't traveling anymore. And so we, we had a lot of extra buses initially. Uh, so we used those to uh, provide extra buses on the, on the most busiest fixed routes. And so we were able to maintain a pretty good uh, level, you know, tr try to keep the rides down to maximum of 10 people on, the, on a bus. Uh, we suspended fare collection on March 27th, so we've been going three fares since then. Initiated backdoor boarding in order to protect the drivers, give them a little more space, and some relief to the economically distressed riders. Uh, we emphasized that people should only ride uh, if they had essential trips. But with the free fares, we saw an influx of riders. Um, uh, our drivers began to call off some of them, utilizing the family first provisions. Uh, and so then we didn't have enough drivers to run the full weekday service. On April 6th, we reduced it to Saturday level service on the weekdays, which means less buses and hours. All, all the routes run, but it's less frequency. And, uh, and we closed the terminals <clears throat> uh, since we didn't need to sell bus passes. Uh, we took care of lost and found and customer comments by appointment or phone. We're going to reopen uh, on that same appointment basis, but people can come inside as of Monday along with the rest of the county. We're beginning to, on May 7th, we installed a prototype uh, barrier on the bus, plexiglass barrier. We've had a hard time getting supplies, but uh, we plan to do a campaign and equip all the big buses with those barriers. Uh, we expect to get considerable relief from the federal FTA CARES Act. Uh, there was a board, uh, Florida County Commissioners, uh, action to approve our grant applications for that. That'll cover wages and benefits, PPEs, cleaning supplies, and the barriers and, and other things too. Uh, our current ridership is about 55% of normal. Uh, we're thankful that we haven't had any employees get sick. And um, finally, I do have some written plans and status reports. If anybody wants to see anything more formal or in writing, uh, just contact Georgiana or myself and, and we'd be happy to send that on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Any questions for Mr. Nelson? Uh, item 5B is the Technical Advisory Committee, Citizens Advisory Committee, the CAC CAC report. Georgiana. Thank you. Uh, the TAC CAC met virtually last Friday, and in your uh, handout box, you'll find a 
summary of actions and attendance from the meeting. Uh, the TACCAC uh, recommended that the TPO approve the minutes of March 9th, 2020. Um, the fiscal year 21 through 22 final unified planning work program. The Florida Transportation Performance Measures Consensus Planning Document. Uh, the work order uh, for the State of the System Scope of Services. Uh, resolution 20-16, the agreement with Florida East Coast Railway and Virgin Trains USA for the 2020 build grant. And finally, the 2019 FDOT certification of the Space Coast TPO. All right, thank you, Georgiana. So I'm gonna need a motion for acknowledge of the receipt of the draft TAC CAC meeting minutes of March 9, 2020. Motion by Commissioner Lober, second by Lorraine Cox. Okay, for discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye and raise your hand. <laughs> We've got Lorraine Koss, Brian Lober, Frank Forrester. I saw Jerry for a second. Christina Znardi, Yvonne Minus. Jerry was there and gone. Um, Skip Williams, Robert Jordan, Andrea Young. And Mr. Nolan, you've been unmuted. You're Hi. Hi. And Mayor Meehan. All right. Thank you, Lori. And the motion passes. Item 5C is the Florida Department of Transportation, also known as the FDOT report. And that will be given by Anna Taylor. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, Anna. Loud and clear. Good afternoon, my name is Anna Taylor. I'm filling in for Jamie today. Um, wanted to let you guys know that the construction report is in your packets. Um, also letting you know that um, the department did give a presentation to your board back in February regarding improvements to the A1A corridor um, in Satellite Beach, um, as well as Indian Harbor. Um, and Melbourne area uh, regarding some improvements that we would be making to the RRFBs. Uh, two Fridays ago, May the 1st, the Florida Department of Transportation was able to execute all of those improvements and they are now open to the public. The Southern 10 RRFBs have been turned on and are working. Um, I know that earlier last week, um, I did give a report to the TAC CAC regarding, um, there were some questions regarding the Ellis Road interchange and when that would be open. The, many thought it would be today. Um, that is not the case. We are inching on completing that and opening it up. And at this time, the department is vetting a ribbon cutting uh, but given all of the situation with COVID-19, we're trying to figure out when the best time would be to do that. So I will report back to all of you as soon as that information becomes available. And that is my report. So, uh, uh, Anna, do you have an idea when on that Ellis Road project, uh, when that may be in June or in the, or like? Um, well, I just want to clarify, when the interchange is ready to open, um, the department will go ahead and move forward with opening it. Okay. Um, I think right now there's some uh, back and forth with the county regarding their project that's going on out there. Um, so I think we're trying to coordinate when their portion is going to be ready to open. Um, we're all on a very similar uh, schedule. So I think we're just trying to coordinate that. Um, so I want to be clear that the interchange opening is not dependent on a ribbon cutting. Um, I just know that this has been a community project in which there was a lot of um, expression on the TAC CAC call that they would like to see um, the interchange celebrated. Uh, and so the department is vetting that, but in, in no means will we not be opening that interchange waiting on a ceremony, okay. if that was your question. Yeah. That too. Okay. You answer my question. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Taylor? All right. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Next is uh, item six, the consent agenda, and Georgiana. I'll read the consent agenda, and you can take 
consider passing in one most motion if you choose. Uh, the governing board minutes of March 12th, 2020. Committee appointments, and you do have an add-on in, uh, uh, this is for an appointment for the Bicycle Pedestrian and Trails Committee, and that letter is in your handout box for your reference. Finance and budget, uh, this is our fiscal year 21st and second quarterly report. Um, our final fiscal year 21 through 22 Unified Planning Work Program, which is our work plan. Um, the Florida Transportation Performance Measures Consensus Planning Document. Work Order 20-11K, that's our 2019 State of the System Scope of Services that we conduct every year. And then um, the intent to renew interlocal and lease agreements with Brevard County Board and County Commissioners. All right, thank you, Georgiana. So now I need a motion. Motion by Skip Williams. Uh, second by Robert Jordan. All right, D uh, discussion? Seeing none, I'll need a hand, a hand up. Raise your hand or a vote. <laughs> We have Lorraine Koss, Brian Lober, Frank Forrester, Brian Anderson, Christina Snardi, Yvonne Minus, Skip Williams, Robert Jordan, Andrea Young, Mayor Meehan. And I vote aye. We're missing uh, Mr. Allender. Oh, Mr. Allender, I have unmuted. Mr. Allender, would you like to cast your vote? May have stepped away. Um, we'll move on to Jim Nolan. I have unmuted Mr. Nolan. He'll need to unmute himself. Mr. Nolan, if you could please unmute yourself to cast your vote. Leave us with 10 pot of oh, we, we just, okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And the motion passes. Uh, item number seven are under action items uh, acceptance of the 2019 DOT certificate cer certification of the Space Coast TPO, Anna Taylor. Um, yes, this year um, we completed the 2019 FDOT certification and we have considered the Space Coast TPO a low risk. Um, I just want to thank the staff for all of their hard work and their continued partnership as well as the boards. I um, want to commend you guys on your work toward the Vision Zero uh, resolution and the adoption as well as the Bike Ped Master Plan. Um, we appreciate all of your hard work and looking forward to another great year. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. We all are looking for a great year. Uh, any questions for Ms. Taylor? Um, Ms. Koss, you've been unmuted. All right, Ms. Koss? Oh. Hello? Oh, I think she was attempting to make a motion. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I need a motion for the acceptance of the 2019 FDOT certification of the Space Coast TPO. Robert Jordan, followed by Lorraine Cox. All right, so I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, all right. Those in favor, raise your hand. Lorraine Cox, Brian Lober, Frank Forrester, Christina Snardi. Yvonne Minus, Skip Williams, Robert Jordan, Andrea Young, Mayor Meehan. And I vote aye. Um, we're back up. We missed a few. Um, I'm unmuting Mr. Nolan. Mr. Nolan, you are unmuted if you'd like to cast your vote. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Anderson went offline. Yeah. And we're still to, missing Mr. Allender. Do you want me to try okay. Mr. Allender? We can try Allender one more time. All right, let's try. M Mr. Allender, you are unmuted if you'd like to cast your vote verbally.
Item 7B is um, the approval of Resolution 20-16, Agreement with the Florida East Coast Railroad and Virgin Trains USA 2020 for the Build Grant, Georgiana. At the May Governing Board meeting, uh, we were given the green light uh, to begin work on a build grant with Florida East Coast Railroad to add a second track and improve signaling capabilities to a freight only corridor. This is north of State Road 528 after where Bright Line leaves the corridor heading west to Orlando. Um, here's a map um, of the location. It involves five grade crossings and is a little over four miles long from Frontenac to the Cocoa Junction. This will help remove a major freight mobility and passenger rail bottleneck on the rail corridor. It reduces grade crossing wait times for vehicles and allow, allows trains to pass one another without stopping. Um, I would say that this, you know, the, the benefits would be very much a local and regional uh, uh, project, uh, which meets the, the requirements for the build grant. The Florida East Coast Railroad is a critical infrastructure on Florida's strategic and remote system. Um, there is an opportunity for public-private partnership 50% private sector match to the USDOT grant. Um, the funds can be obligated by September of 2020. Um, the plan is, is to go after fiscal year 17 and 18 old Tiger funds. So the funds from USDOT would not be taken away from any other project here in Brevard County. Um, our attorney, uh, Mr. Googleman, uh, has been working on developing to outline the roles and the responsibilities between the parties for reimbursement and payment of the grant if we if we happen to get awarded the grant. As we are the applicant and Florida East Coast Railroad is the sub-applicant, and of course Virgin Trains is participating in the match, we want to make sure that all the roles and the responsibilities are very clearly um, laid out um, and we know who is responsible for what. This is very time sensitive and the grant will be submitted this afternoon uh, through grants.gov once we get your approval. And so we are asking for approval of resolution 20-16 authorizing general counsel and the executive director to execute the final agreement with Florida East Coast Railroad and Virgin Trains USA for the 2020 bill grant and any subsequent documentation that may be needed for submission uh, of the grant. Okay, thank you, Georgiana. So I'll need a motion. Motion by Lober, second by Robert Jordan. All right, discussion? Seeing none, those in favor, raise your hand. Of course, say aye. Mm -hmm. All right, Lorraine Koss, Brian Lober, Frank Forrester, Brian Anderson, Christina Znardi, Yvonne Minus, Skip Williams, Robert Jordan, Mayor Mann? Aye. Okay, I've unmuted Mr. Nolan. Mr. Nolan, if you'd like to unmute yourself and cast your vote verbally. Aye. And Andrew Young. Andrea Young, I've unmuted you if you'd like to unmute yourself and cast your vote verbally. We still have 10, which is a quorum, which is approval. All right, very good. The motion passes. Very good. Uh, item number eight presentations. Uh, 8A is the Florida Transportation Plan update, and that will be Judy Pizzo. All right, Judy, I am about to send over the change you to the presenter. Thank you. Let me show my screen. You did. Yes, that's my cute little daughter saying. Oh, All right. Unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody. Judy Pisa with Florida Department of Transportation. 
Yes, I have presented to you before on an update for the Florida Transportation Plan, but last year's campaign was on technology and resiliency. This is the last two campaigns on state and interregional and regional and local. Now, those of you that were in attendance last Friday at the TAC and the CAC, yes, you will be hearing the same presentation. But don't zone out on me. This is actually an opportunity, I see it as such, for you to, if you thought of things after the meeting, you can add your, your additional thoughts. See, so it's all good. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Again, my role is to inform you about this update, highlight key trends, but most importantly, encourage your input. So a couple examples here. Why does the transportation plan matter? As you, most of you can see on this slide, and if there's anyone on the phone, I apologize, but I wanna highlight two of the current transportation plans the 2020 Florida Trans Transportation Plan, which was adopted in 2000. It is the uh, Strategic Intermodal System. It, I'm sorry, the 2025, I am off to a strange start here. The 2025, which was updated in 2005, that one included an emphasis on coordinating and supporting regional visions and collaborations needed to achieve those visions. The 2060, which was adopted in 2010, brought a much more economic-centered approach to transportation policy, including alignment with the Florida Strategic Plan for Economic Development and the Florida Mobility and Trade Plan. I also want to make note that the Florida um, Plan for Freight and Mobility Trade Plan was adopted here recently in February of 2020. So this slide shows us our goals and policies. The current update has three elements, a vision element looking out 50 years, a policy element with a 25 year horizon to match the MPO or the TPO's long range transportation plans, and an implementation plan element. The updated plan may also include a fourth element being the performance element. The goals from the last FTP update are remaining highly intact. Refinements made to them, such as linking transportation choices to improvements in accessibility and equity, very important, reflect input from our partners and the public, which is my role here today. The goal areas are representative of the themes that have historically been highlighted in past transportation plans and consider emerging trends and technologies that are impacting the transportation system. Objectives identified for these goals often overlap goal areas. This update of the plan will consider objectives and strategies within four cross-cutting topics to better align the objectives and strategies and provide a clear direction for transportation. These topics are technology and resilience, which I mentioned earlier, we talked about last year, and today state and interregional transportation and regional and local needs. This slide shows you those potential areas to be covered under the four cross-cutting topics. Note that resilience also includes the economic and societal changes and as well as the environmental changes. They include technology, resilience, state and interregional, regional and local. And I'm not gonna read all the categories underneath that in the interest of time. Emerging trends for the four cross cutting topics have been identified for this update and have been documented in emerging trend handouts, which are available to you today, also available on the website. Technology is offering new ways of traveling and changing the way we move freight, our behavior, and how we use, share, and manage data. Brands relating to resilience, which especially here in Central Florida, need to be integrated more fully into our planning, project development, and other processes. Among the most important things to consider, questions you might think of for yourself, what natural hazards impact our transportation system? 
what types of extreme weather can affect the mobility of Floridians? How can transportation systems be resilient to evolving economic trends? And how can we better understand how our transportation infrastructure is vulnerable to hazards and threats? Trends related to state and interregional transportation encompasses multiple modes and focuses on linking regions together into a single state and connecting Florida to markets around the nation and world, the world. Among the potential areas to cover under regional and local needs, cross-cutting topics, <clears throat> excuse me, are those issues and interests of urbanized, non-urbanized, and rural areas of the state, congestion relief, land use, and community planning, regional visions, the environment, and economic development. Infographic notes from Central Florida representation presentations focus on these cross-cutting topics. This is your opportunity now. If you are familiar with my past presentations, you have an opportunity to participate in a poll everywhere. And if you take your smart device, you can either with the camera from your smart device, uh, scan the QR code or into your laptop or tablet web browser, key in www.polev.com forward slash FTP 2045. I've got a few slides for you to answer, and uh, this should go pretty quick. So, not hearing any words or sounds of discouragement, I'm going to move forward. If anybody hasn't logged on, just let me know. So, the first slide we need to know who do you represent? And you can key in the letters relative to the category A through G. I see many of you have already caught that. And if anybody's having any trouble, just let me know. I can uh, manually log your comments or your category. The next, as people are working forward, great. This is what trend is the most important to you or will have the biggest impact on Florida's transportation plan. And again, if you can see the screen, but you can't log, just let me know. Okay. Next, in your opinion, what is the greatest challenge for Florida to overcome related to changing technology and our transportation system? I know for the departments, integrating old, existing, and new and emerging technologies in the same system. That's a big challenge for us. Data security and privacy. Many local governments are having trouble with being hacked. I know that's extremely challenging and expensive uh, problem. Planning and design changes, regulatory barriers. Okay, that looks like it's settled in. Uh, a couple more chiming in. And again, I can log your responses if you can't key into this. And here's where, okay. We've either tagged on to somebody or you guys are being very, very uh, progressive here. We've got bicycle transportation, limited right of ways, not focusing on moving cars faster and expensive people's lives, context sensitive design, aerotransit, rail transit, flexible funding. There needs to be more connectivity of public transportation, level of service, and some type of rail. So these are regional or local needs that should be considered as we update the FTP. And somebody posted a star. <laughs> This is the last slide that you get to uh, add your thoughts to. 
What are some strategies to increase your statewide mobility for people in freight in the next five eight to 10 years? This is a little bit short of term. We're not looking out 50 years. We're, we're looking at the next five to 10 years. This is your opportunity to say to the department, this is what we need. falls under the interregional working with driverless automobiles. That's going to be a challenge, the autonomous vehicles. And dedicated transit funding, very important. Okay, that looks like it's settled in another moment or two. team presented to the diverse 30 plus member steering committee who's guiding the, the update. More information is available on our website and I'll give you that link on the last slide here, including more information on cross-cutting topics. There are multiple ways to get involved ranging from complete, excuse me, completing the online surveys to providing comments using the general feedback form. Also shown is the transportation plan update schedule for 2020, which is subject to change due to the COVID-19 virus. Planning for the regional <laughs> workshops is on pause, but it is rumored that they will be virtual workshops. We're working on that. The draft plan will have the 30-day public comment period and publication is still anticipated for December. So looking on the screen, you'll see that the regional workshops go from May through June. Again, we're hoping for them to be virtual. Draft, drafting the policy plan is July through August, but we can still take input or comments anytime during this period. The uh, policy plan will be going to management from September to October, and November will be the comment period for the public. And again, closing it up in December. So here it is. The end of my story, uh, there is a link for the website as well as a screenshot of the website for the transportation plan update, www.floridatransportationplan.com. Uh, as I've said in the past, there is a wealth of information up on that website, great uh, research material, reference material, TED Talks, and opportunities to take additional uh, surveys if you choose. So, Barring questions, thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Judy. Any questions for Judy? All right, seeing none, very good job, Judy. Great information. Item number 8B, 2045, long-range transportation plan update. Stephen Gostill. Good afternoon, everyone. And we're switching our screen back over here. And uh, I do believe we're, we're going to get back into, uh, have a mentee question at the end for you. So if you could navigate back to your mentee tab, wherever you have that open on your computer or your phone, we will have a, just one question at the end of the presentation. And so I'm going to give you a quick update on where we're at in our long range plan. And so if you recall, I was came before you last month yeah. and so, uh, just what I gave you a quick update on everything and so right now where we're at um, today we'll go over a summary of the environmental outreach that we did uh, go over how we're going through and developing the cost feasible plan methodology and that's the big question we want to make sure everyone agrees with the path that we're taking to prioritize the projects and uh, move them into the cost feasible plan and uh, Travis is going to come up and talk uh, more about the methodology and the cost feasible plan scenarios. Uh, so I mentioned the environmental outreach meeting. Um, we did go out, we met with all of the other technical stakeholders throughout with all the municipalities and the local agencies. And uh, after that, we took all of their input to develop the needs plan. 
And then we sat down with all of these environmental agencies to see if they had any big environmental concerns because we've heard loud and clear that's something we as a TPO need to take a closer look at and get some, um, bring some other of these entities to the table sooner rather than later. And so we had a really good discussion with all of them and uh, everyone agreed that we'd really like to meet periodically to discuss transportation issues more as they come along. And so we would really like to get them together every year to go when we start our call for projects, go develop our project priorities um, to, for those projects that are starting to move into the pipeline to get their input before the projects start. So there, we heard from that meeting that there might be opportunities for other agencies to get involved, to bring more to the table, maybe funding wise or resource wise to do other projects in conjunction with those transportation projects. So it was a really, really good meeting. Um, and then they also looked at a really high level screening of all of the projects that have been identified for the long range plan to see if there's any major environmental issues with any of the proposed projects. And so if you recall at our last TPO meeting, you, everyone, um, the board endorsed and approved the new project priorities development methodology that Laura and Sarah have worked very hard on and the technical committee has approved. And so it made a lot of sense for us to use a similar approach for our initial screening of all the long range plan needs projects. And so we started out by going through all of the projects and giving them that same type of technical support based on the same criteria. Um, but realizing that the long range plan projects are a bit more complicated than that. A lot of them have been in place for quite a while. We realize there's some thing, other things that need to be considered as well. So um, phase consideration. So if a project only needs construction funding, it should move up to the top of the list regardless of its score so we can get it completed. Um, and same with uh, other, other projects that are currently under design, need right away, um, things like that. And then we also have to do our discretionary review, of the reality check to make sure that the project is going to be feasible in this LRTP time frame and that the project has local support because we don't want to move forward with something that's not supported locally and wherever the project is and that the travel, the traffic data model supports the need and the, the modeling kind of shows that there's a problem there. And so that is currently where we're at with um, the scoring process and then so some of the other things that all the pr projects um, being screened or we're taking into consideration. Uh, does the project need state or federal funding? Because we really want to target big projects here um, to leverage those federal and state funds. And then is it in the travel demand model? Has it been in the prior long range plan? Is it identified in any exist other TPO or local agency plans? Uh, do we think it will be needed in the next 20 years? And then I, I mentioned before, does it have local support or funding? And so Travis is going to give you a little reminder about the financial forecasting, and then he's going to go through and talk about some of our funding scenarios we're going to work on. Oh, thanks, Steve. Thank Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, Travis Hills. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Staying healthy. Yes, we all are. <laughs> Cool. So uh, once again, I'm Travis Hills with Kittle Center Associates. Uh, I apologize. Uh, there's a couple slides in here that we presented back at our March meetings, but we wanted to provide a little bit of a refresher as we kind of move into talking about our, our cost feasible plan and what we're going to be doing for that. So the first slide that we have here, uh, this one was presented back in March. We were talking about uh, financial forecasting. So we wanted to provide an overview of uh, our state and local revenues that we're going to be uh, that we uh, projected in order to help us uh, develop our cost feasible plan. And so as you'll see, uh, state and federal programs, we're looking at about $3.4 billion uh, for those. And those include uh, CIS funding, other roadways and right of way, that's gonna be your state road funding, uh, transit funding, and then the final two are transportation management area and transportation alternatives, otherwise known as TMA and TA funding sources as well. And those are state and federal programs that we get funding for. Uh, local revenue sources, we're looking at about 1.5 billion for that. It includes transportation impact fees, state distributed fuel taxes, and then the local option fuel taxes. Uh, as you'll see over on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we're looking to see, we, we have about 800 million of that 
already committed to operations and maintenance within the county. And so um, while that 1.5 billion in the local revenue looks like a big number, uh, we're looking at about a little bit less than half of that's already uh, committed for that operations and maintenance. And then a little bit more on financial forecasting, uh, something that we're gonna be looking at are potential new revenue sources. And so the few that we have listed here are a sales surtax. And so this is either a half a percent or 1% uh, additional sales surtax. And you'll be looking at about 1.2 to 2.3 billion dollars um, in additional revenue uh, that we could use for transportation projects. Uh, another uh, alternative as well is uh, local option fuel taxes and this is above and beyond what's already being collected today uh, in the form of a one to five cent uh, additional uh, option fuel tax which could generate an additional 215 million dollars. Uh, there's also the nine cent uh, tax that we could leverage on non-diesel fuel. Uh, that would get us about another 100 million for transportation projects as well. Uh, in addition, or in total, we're looking at about 1.5 to 2.6 billion dollars in untapped revenue uh, through these potential new revenue sources. And I know that uh, a lot of these discussions will be had over the coming months, especially with the impacts of, of COVID, and um, you know, just kind of seeing how that, how we think that's going to play a factor in the future. And We'll probably get this question, so I'll try to answer it now. Um, no, we are, we're not gonna be updating our revenue projections. Um, this is something that we're working with the most current uh, information, as Stephen, Stephen would say, uh, most current information that we have. Um, and so the state has given us these numbers uh, that we're working with right now. We won't be able to update them until uh, the state goes through and updates for those uh, COVID impacts at some point in the future. So moving into the cost feasible plan development, uh, there's a couple different funding programs uh, that we want to outline for you. This will help provide the base for our cost feasible plan. Uh, the first one is uh, utilizing the state and local funding sources for your roadway uh, capacity and intersection projects. So this is your probably more straightforward, uh, your most common uh, LRTP uh, or most common cost feasible plan uh, list. So it's going to be your roadway widening, your intersection projects. Uh, there's a bunch of those that are on our list that we all know about um, that we want to get done. Um, and then another kind of part of the cost feasible plan are going to be what we call boxed funds. Um, and those are going to be set asides for specific project types, not specific projects. So um, a couple of those project types below, uh, bike ped master plan, so uh, bike, uh, bike facilities, sidewalks, adding those on our priority corridors, uh, prioritized ITS improvements, uh, transit operations and maintenance, uh, study implementation projects. So we've done a bunch of studies uh, in the county. We want to get those uh, projects moving forward and get things implemented. And then safety projects. And so, like I said, it's not a specific, we're going to dedicate this funding for a specific project, but it's a pool of projects that we can pull from and apply that funding towards. So we're going to do something a little bit different with this go around with the cost feasible plan. We're going to develop a couple different scenarios. And so uh, scenario one, I like to say, is your traditional cost feasible plan approach. So it's going to be allocating a majority of our funding to our high priority capacity roadway and intersection projects. So really uh, getting those major projects that we put a lot of money towards so far. We want to get those at the top of our list, move them forward, apply funding and hopefully get them built sooner rather than later. Uh, the rest of the funding will go towards our boxed funds. And what we're doing is we're allocating a certain percentage, uh, typically the same type of percentage that we had from the 2040 LRTP, and we're putting that, uh, setting those funds aside for the different box funds program that I, that I talked about in the previous slide. Uh, scenario two, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna take a majority of our funds or a larger portion of those funds and apply them towards box funds projects. And, and really that's towards uh, getting to placing a higher emphasis on safety and multimodal mobility. So those were a couple of the things that came out of all of our public engagement. People wanted more safety projects, they wanted safer roads, wanted more, more mobility as well. Um, and so kind of on the flip side of that, more money going towards our box funds projects would mean a little bit less money going towards our capacity projects. So you may see uh, the difference between scenarios one and two is a few of those kind of projects at the bottom of the list may not get done in scenario two as opposed to scenario one. Uh, and then scenario three, we're going to utilize a couple of those new revenue sources to potentially look at uh, maybe additional projects that haven't been funded in scenarios one and two. So really kind of above and beyond here, if we tap into some additional revenue, here's some extra things that we could get done within the county. There we go. All right, now we're Travis, 
And uh, these are, just want to up, wrap up, these are our next steps. Um, we're going to continue the developing the cost feasible plan and we're going to send it out towards the end of the month, uh, beginning of next month for our technical committee to review and make sure that the no surprises anyone. Again, this is a reason why we're here to give everyone an update today is because we just want to keep everyone in the loop and make sure that uh, what the route we're taking makes sense to everyone. And then in June, uh, we will have the draft cost feasible plan open for public comment. And that coincides with when we're planning on having our open house. And then in July, we will be I'll be back up here again and Travis will probably be with me as well. And we'll be talking about um, uh, the, what we came up with with the full cost feasible plan and be looking for adoption. And then we'll work on local agency implementation guides. Um, and that's something that we really want to kind of memorialize some of these projects, especially the local ones, because as staff changes over and uh, things like that, it's the knowledge of where these projects come from and to keep them moving forward. It's important to uh, have all those, all the information to pass on to the next people. And then in September, we have to adopt the full long range plan. And with that, we will go over to our mentee question. And so we want to make see if this all makes sense to you. And so we'll just give this a minute here while we pull it up. And all right. So do you agree with the the method that we're moving forward with the, the development of the cost feasible plan? So uh, just either yes, it makes sense, or no, we need to talk. And again, this will just give us overall direction and feedback that um, we're heading in the right direction. For those that might have come in after we started, to log on to Menti, you go to menti.com and you use the code 174480. And you can do that on your computer, in a web browser, or on your phone. It doesn't have to be just on the phone. And I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Um, there is a comment from Skip Williams in relation to the conversation about additional uh, revenue sources that at this time he is not in favor of raising taxes. And Mr. Lober is submitting a yes, makes sense. All right. Well, we have four yes, makes sense plus Mr. Lober's. I'll assume everyone else says yes, it makes sense. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions? Thank Very you. good presentation. Thank Perfect. you, Thank Travis you. and Stephen. <clears throat> Next is 8C, the 2019 Student School Travel Survey, and that is Kim Smith. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we wanted to give you just a real a high-level flyby of our student travel survey from, from 2019. Um, just a little bit of history on our travel survey. We've actually been conducting this every other year since the year 2000. So we have um, basically 10 surveys or 20 years worth of data. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of numbers that the TPO has stored about how our school kids um, get to school in non-COVID times, obviously. Right? The, these numbers don't, don't mean anything right now. Um, like I said, it is conducted every other year. It's conducted the first hour of whatever, because they all have different times that they show up at school, so it's, it's conducted the first hour of their school day. We do it on the same day, um, district-wide, and that isn't an attempt to get like weather conditions. Of course, we have a county that's 72 miles long, so we have had years where we know it's raining in Titusville and dry, dry as a bone in Palm Bay, so, but it's just, it's just the luck of the draw at that point. Um, we actually, in 2012, and it says 14, but in 2012, we started collecting afternoon travel, um, travel survey data on the students, and we do see some difference in those numbers. So um, it's, it's good to have how they get to school and they get, they get home from school. And this, um, for the most part, up to this point, has been used to guide safe routes to school applications. A lot of the municipalities have gotten it and that's primarily how it's been used. So if you look here, um, you can see that obviously in 2019, the primary way 
of getting to school was by personal vehicle. And of course, you know, that's, we know that, that's part of the problem. We've all been around schools at, at arrival and dismissal. And when you, when you look at this, that's a number we know can come down. And this is a breakdown of how, how the students get to school by the type of school, as you see there, elementary, middle, junior high school, um, and then some of our, our other like charter and choice schools. Oops, too fast. <laughs> All right, so here, here we look at breakdown by school and, and how many of those students get to school by bus. And here's percentage of, this is um, how the, bi the bicycle, how they get to school. Actually, it has two in from, and those, those even out about the same. But what's, what's interesting, if you look at the next slide, when you go to walking, if you look at the walking, especially at the elementary and middle school, um, the, the percentage is quite a bit higher in the afternoon. So you have, you have um, folks that are dropping their kids off in the morning and then they're having to walk home. So that, that's good information for us to know. Um, so here's, these are just averages for 2019. We had 88% of our students report that they wore their seatbelt. Unfortunately, we only had 48% uh, report that they wore their bicycle helmet, um, which is not a number that, that we're happy with. We keep trying to get that, that number up, but it is, it is what it is. Um, here is helmet usage breakdown by type of school. I don't think it's any big surprise that obviously at the elementary level, we have our biggest compliance with um, students wearing a helmet. And you can see we've had a steady decline in usage, another statistic that we're not happy with. And just as a point of reference, in 1999, the state of Florida did adopt the helmet law as it currently sits, which means that if you are under the age of 16, you have to have a properly fitted helmet on your head. And you can see, so in 19, or excuse me, in the year 2000, we had pretty good compliance. Um, because anytime you enact a, a new law, you're gonna have good compliance. Um, to me, and based on what I know through being in this program for a long time, this decline is, is in big part, um, and I'm not, not trying to, to get on anybody, but the lack of enforcement. This is just something that, you know, our law enforcement officers get involved with a lot of other things, and the kids don't feel like the police officers are going to say anything to them, and they don't think about their health. This, this slide actually gives us some encouragement though. If you look at the schools that have traditionally done the TPO's uh, school-based bicycle safety program, they fared much better with wearing their helmets and by much better, almost 30%. So, so we are happy to report on that and that average, again, while not real happy, is, is at 59% and 30% higher than those schools that aren't doing the regular education program. And moving forward, how are we going to use this data? Now that we've, we've broken it down and, and there's a lot more of it, um, and you will be able to see that here in the not, not too distant future. Um, I do have to thank Chelsea on our staff for doing the data analysis on, on all of this data that we have. It's, it's not something that, that I would be very good at. So I appreciate the fact that, that she took a, a long, deep dive into this, but it's going to be able to guide how we use our resources and our programs and go into those schools that don't have the higher um, compliance with, with the helmet law and, and work and do things like that. So it will definitely help us on how to direct our resources. And like I said, in the future, we will have a um, interactive web-based platform that you'll be able to go in and, and this this data gets really broken down. You can even go in and look at it all the way down to the classroom level at some points where, where you can see a, you know, a classroom teacher's name and, and how that class you know, reported back on this survey. So, and we didn't, did we, we got rid of the other question. All right, any questions for uh, Kim? Mr. Forrester, I will unmute you. Thank you. Kim, can, can you roll back to the slide that had the uh, uh, helmet usage from 
2000 to the current? I can try. <laughs> it, it, it appeared that there was a, almost a 20% drop in helmet usage in the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, it's... Yeah, there. Oh. There you go. Okay, this is this is just the overall average, and yes, there's there is um, it's actually quick math here thirty four percent. Did I do that correct, yeah. Ms. Ms. Carter, Ms. Numbers yeah. Lady? <laughs> uh, 34 percent decline in, in helmet usage um, since the year two thousand. Yes, on average. And then again, Any, uh, and then again to compare that. that any reason why? Um, as, as I mentioned, I think a big part of it is, is enforcement of the law. Because it's, it's certainly not that there aren't helmets available. The TPO, on average, I would say we give out 2,000, 2,500 helmets a year that we've been able to get. Um, you know, at times we, we, we purchase them, but for the most part, every single helmet we've given out has been through a state grant program. Um, there's not a reason why a student in this county um, that wants a helmet um, shouldn't have one. There are resources available. Um, and like I said, I'm not trying to, to get down on law enforcement. They have an awful lot on their plate. Um, respect them. Was one. <laughs> you know, served serve my time and, and I understand, but I think that that's a, that's a big part of it. Because I, when I talk to, to the students, you know, they're like, well, I ride by, by the police officers and they don't care whether I wear it or not, so why should I? And of course, being young, they don't, they don't understand that how they can, you know, crack their head open and cause real problems, so. Could that also be part of the home base too? Parents should be encouraging helmets and... Certainly. And the community too. Yes, so certainly. if you got the school guard out there, they should be saying something. And, and actually our school, school guards do, um, do a real good job at this. Um, if you saw our newsletter, our, our Palm Bay School Crossing Guard Supervisor is retiring. She's been very good at it. Uh, Deb Morancy with the Brevard County, the overseas the Brevard County Guard Program is, is very good at having her guards identify. And she's actually had all of her guards trained in helmet fit. And when they see kids that don't have them, they will make arrangements to get them. So they've worked on it. But yeah, it starts at home. You know, if, if a parent will encourage the the um, kid to wear them when they're leaving the house, there's a, there's a good chance that they're gonna wear them. Okay, Kim, do you think you could round this up some info on the effectiveness of bicycle helmets for students? Uh, I'm sure you've got that somewhere in your computer. The um, effectiveness you know, in, you mean the effectiveness what, uh, of printing? How much uh, does it increase damage from accidents and so on and so forth? So, so depending on what source you look at, the effectiveness of a bicycle helmet in the event of a crash and preventing a more severe injury is anywhere from 88 to 92 percent more effective at, at re, um, you know, in reducing injuries, head injuries in right. case of a fall wow. or... Maybe you can put together that well, some summary part. Maybe, maybe we need to, uh, to do some communication with our local, the heads of our local law enforcement agencies and and uh, talk to them about some of this. Maybe we can get some help. Okay, thank you, Mr. Forster. All right, any other questions? That's it for me. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. And we're getting close to the end. Our next meeting will be July 9th, 2020. Um, and then certainly, I don't know whether we'll be doing another virtual. We are not sure yet. Yeah, we're still not sure. We'll have to wait and see. That's right. So, yeah. Before Sarah. we um, adjourn, Madam Chair, I would just like to get some feedback in regards to okay. the virtual platform so that we can improve for any future meetings in case we do have to do them virtually or if we choose to begin doing other meetings virtually as well. So, if you could please go back to your menti.com, that is M E N T I.com. Once again, you can log on via. The, your cell phone or your um, web browser and put in the code 174480. So our first question is, is on a scale of one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest. So one being 
we hated this, and five being you guys are awesome, um, how would you rank the virtual format overall? So this is everything, everything about today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, well, everything about the meeting today. I don't yeah. want to. <laughs> and the more feedback we get, remember, the better that we can be. So don't, and this is anonymous. <laughs> I think it just means that they just like seeing each other better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could be it too. So, on, like on a scale of one to five, pub, <laughs> on a scale of one to five, how would you rank the virtual voting process? So that was the process of you raising your hand in order to make motions and voting. How did you like that in a virtual setting? Give it just a couple more minutes on voting. Overall seems to be positive. I just have two more questions. Hang in there with me. I know everyone's it's the afternoon. Next one is on a scale of one to five, how comfortable did you feel providing input via the virtual format? So how comfortable did you feel sharing um, any questions, comments, or during the process. <laughs> We're all over the map. You did it right. <laughs> it would be hard, you know, I think. All right. And then finally, and this would be the most important, I think, out of the questions is how could we improve virtual meetings in the future? And so this is a fill in the blank. Um, you can you know, write in how you think that we, what improvements we could make. As um, Commissioner Lober has stated in the question box that the audio stands to be improved and, and um, we, we have ordered new equipment. So hopefully, if we do need to do this in the future, we'll have better audio. So make sure everyone is comfortable and able to use the format. We've discussed having a practice run um, if we do this again as a, as a possibility, if that would be something that people would be open to that you'd like to, you know, a couple days before have a, it helps to see all a practice. For, so they weren't able to see each other. So this was not a visual. It was, mm -hmm. we have webcams here, but we do not have their webcams turned on. We can, so we can back. change that. We can try it. Yeah. If we, we want to see everybody's, you know, living rooms, we oh, can, we can turn them on. <laughs> Enter. Pause and scroll. It's okay. All right. No more virtual meetings. Let's get back to normal next <laughs> month. <laughs> we, we miss you, too. Yeah, yes. we miss you, too. All right, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for all of the feedback and for hanging with us during these yeah. virtual times. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you for your patience and thank you, board, for participating today. We really appreciate your comments and raising your hand. So have a good uh, week, and I will adjourn this meeting at 3.01. All right, very good. Why did Skip for you, Dave?